We are called to worship one God and one God alone. So God gives the Ten Commandments, Exodus, the 20th chapter. Don't have any other gods before me. No graven images, no idols, no other gods. Let me read some of these verses to you. Exodus chapter 23, verse 24, is one of many places that reiterates the same truth. Exodus 23, 24, do not bow down before their gods, namely the gods of the Canaanites and the others, or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Who do you worship? You worship Yahweh, your God. That's it. Joshua exhorts the people towards the end of his life. Joshua chapter 23, verse 7. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God, to Yahweh your God, as you have until now. And then this is the consistent witness of the prophets. Now, I want to explain this first. The primary emphasis is not the nature of the one God, the substance of the one God. It is not even how he reveals himself or makes himself known. The primary emphasis is Yahweh alone. No other gods. Don't bow down to the Baals or the, or the Asherahs or any of these other gods. Don't bow down to the gods of Egypt. Don't bow down to the gods of the Canaanites. Don't worship any other gods. Idolatry was rife in those countries. Idolatry was everywhere. It was part of the culture. Polytheism was the way of life. No other gods. You have one God and one God only. There is no discussion as to the nature of that one God or how he reveals himself or the essence of his being or if his unity is complex, that's not the discussion. The emphasis is one God and one God alone. So this is reiterated in the prophets, just representative verses from Isaiah 44, 8. Do not tremble, do not be afraid, did not I proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Isaiah 45, 5. Just one page to turn, but it's a thin piece of paper. I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, speaking to Cyrus. Verse 18, for this is what Yahweh says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. 45, 22, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Every follower of Jesus who reads those words without hesitation, without reservation, without question, without definition, without need for any further insight says, absolutely, amen, we worship one God and one God only. No idols, no other gods. We abhor the worship of other gods. All idols must be smashed of any kind. All other deities must be repudiated. There is one God, one God only, who created the universe. That's the consistent testimony of the entire scripture. When I say the entire scripture, I mean the Tanakh and the New Covenant writings. And the New Testament affirms that as well. When I say it's the witness of the entire scripture. So let's look in Mark, for example. Mark chapter 12. The teaching of Yeshua. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Hey, that's in the New Testament too. All these verses we were reading earlier today about what the prophet said. New Testament says the same thing. When Yeshua saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Sit. God is one. There is no other but him. No argument on this. 
New Testament affirms this as well. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 15 and 16. It speaks of God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. So so the New Testament teaches us that no one has seen God or can see him, and he lives in unapproachable light. And he is the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. One God, one God only, that is all that we worship. The question is, what is the nature of this God? Is he in any way complex in his unity? You may read in the Hebrew Bible about Baal this and Baal this and Baal this. Baal meant master or lord. He was one of the prominent deities in Canaanite culture. But you'd have different Baals in different cities. The Baal of this place and the Baal of this place. The Lord of Dallas, the Lord of New York, the Lord of the... This was a, a pagan idol that was worshipped in different places. And, and God was saying, no, I, I am not many different gods. I'm one. You worship me alone. But what is the nature of his unity? You say, well, why is that even a question? He says he's one, that ends the subject. Well, because he's God. If, if I talk about an individual human being, even the question of, of our unity and what makes us a person is, is complex. And who we are in the physical realm and the spiritual realm and the emotional realm. You can have a conversation with yourself in your own mind. When, when we die, we, we don't have our physical bodies and yet we continue to exist and we get resurrected bodies. But God... We, we say the ocean is one. It's one ocean. The Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Well, well explain to me its, its oneness. You say, come on, that, that's just a stupid question because you've got to try to put your triune beliefs and your beliefs of Jesus as God, project them back into it. That's the only reason you're asking this question. No, I'm asking it because when I read the Hebrew Scriptures, I find some things that seem to raise questions. In fact, that do raise questions that, that contradict certain traditional Jewish understanding of who God is. And then when I read traditional Jewish literature, I find that the rabbis had questions about these things. No, not about God's unity per se, but questions like how does the infinite, eternal, invisible God reveal himself to man and communicate with the human race and interact? How does it happen? Do you know that the New Testament elsewhere says no one has ever seen God? Yeshua throughout the Gospel of John says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The works I do, it's the Father working me. The words I speak, it's the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I can only do what I see my Father doing. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That same Gospel starts off by saying, no one's seen God. But the only Son who dwells in the bosom of the Father, He's made Him known. This is a Jewish problem. This is a Jewish question, as we'll see a little bit later on. There's no question that the Scriptures call for the worship of one God and one God alone. There's also no question that the Scriptures call, uh, clearly call us not to worship any form of God. In other words, don't don't try to put some form on Him, like an animal. If you've seen pictures of the gods of Egypt, they would have these multiple forms. I've been to India many times, and you'll have monkey gods and this kind of elephant gods. and No, don't, don't, don't make any form because when I revealed myself on Sinai, you didn't see any form. Let's take a look in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. I was talking to my rabbi friend Yisrael a week ago and I said to him, okay, you, you hear some of the arguments I've raised, you've thought about them, you've considered them, when you think them through, what, what causes you to stop in your tracks? No, nope, no, nope, it can't be. I was explaining to him what causes me to stop in my tracks when he gives his arguments. Okay, I understand this. No, nope, no, nope, can't be. So he said Sinai. God's revelation at Sinai. 
In other words, for him, what I believe about Yeshua, what I believe about the nature of God is in fundamental violation of what God said at Sinai. Therefore, he can't believe it. He can't hold to it. Let's, let's take a look. Deuteronomy 4. This is Moses speaking at the end of the wilderness wanderings. Verse 9. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to your children. Skip down to verse 15. You saw no form of any kind the day Yahweh spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol. Now look at this, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like any animal on earth or any bird that flies in the air or like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. Verse 25. This is immediately after saying, Yahweh our God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. After you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. I want to read again, beginning at verse 15. You saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like any animal on earth or any bird that flies in the air, or like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters below. The reasoning would then be, if we attribute deity to Yeshua, say he bears the divine nature, say that he's God in the flesh, say any of those things that we are then worshiping God in the form of a man, and we are guilty of this revelation where God said the whole reason you didn't see anything when, when he came down, they didn't see some giant goat or some, some giant elephant or some giant man. You didn't see any of that. The reason was so that you wouldn't go and make an idol. Of course, the answer to that is very simple. The New Testament writers made the same point. No one's seen God. We don't worship the form of a man any more than the children of Israel worship the form of fire or worship the form of a tabernacle. We still have not seen the substance and the essence of God. He still remains invisible, even though he reveals himself to us through his Son. We do not make statues and idols of the flesh of Jesus and say, this is God, and bow down to a physical form of a man. That to us would be idolatry. Just like this. Now, something very interesting which is as emphatically as God says this here, it, it says in, in Numbers 12, 8, that Moses, who had special access to God, that Moses saw the form of the Lord. It's a very interesting verse. Same Hebrew word, tmunah, form. I asked the rabbi, I said, doesn't that trouble you a little bit with the whole point you're making that it says Moses saw his form? God says here, you didn't see any form to the nation, yet Moses saw his form. I wonder what that means. And the psalmist says in 1715, speaking of his death, when he dies, he's going to see the form of the Lord. Just curious, just wonder what that means. It's raising a little question. We're going to come to the question in a moment. What happens in the Bible where people saw God? Where it explicitly says they saw God. Where else where it says he can't be seen? Exact same thing that we say in terms of, of Yeshua. No, when you, you look at him, you are not physically looking at God. No one can see God. This, this is a fleshly tabernacle in which God is dwelling. John 1.14, he pitched his tent among us. 
No more than you worship the form of the tabernacle do you worship the form of this man. Nothing idolatrous in the concept. But when it says in Numbers 12 that, that Moses saw the form of the Lord, I wonder what he saw. I wonder what was revealed to him. Just put a little question mark there. And I, I've read Deuteronomy and I feel the force of it. Okay, don't make a, an idol in the form of an animal in the form of a man. Correct. We don't make an idol in the form of a man and we don't worship the form of a man and we don't bow down to the flesh and blood of Messiah. There is zero evidence, zero evidence, zero evidence that any of his first followers, his Jewish followers, made statues or pictures or said, this is, this is God, let's hold on to this form and picture and bow down to it. No, they continued to worship the invisible God. No violation here whatsoever of Sinai. If you think of it wrongly, it can hit as a violation. If you think of it rightly, no violation whatsoever. Yeah, but, but hang on. What about the verses that explicitly say that God is not a man? Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a mere human being that he should change his mind. Same context in 1 Samuel 15, 29. God's not a man that he's going to lie and be fickle. Yes, <laughs> correct. God is not a man. God is the eternal, unseen, invisible creator of the universe who also has the power to reveal himself and walk among us while remaining unseen, invisible God in heaven. God did not become a man and cease to be God in heaven. Rather, God's eternal son pitched his tent among us and walked among us. And Yeshua continued to refer to his father as his God, and our God. You say, well, doesn't that deny some trinity in the deity of Jesus? No. Denies a wrong understanding of it, not a right understanding of it. So let me back up and say a few things. The Torah quite plainly forbids worship of any other God, and that is explicitly reiterated by the prophets and explicitly reiterated in the New Covenant writings. We worship no other God but one. In fact, let me show you something. At the end of this all, in the book of Revelation, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but in Revelation chapter 22, look at what's written there. Beginning in verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. Notice this. The throne of God and of the Lamb, speaking of the Messiah, will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. We will worship one God forever and ever. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And this is the same book that explicitly identifies the Messiah with God himself, both of whom are Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. So the scriptures, Tanakh, New Covenant, explicitly state we worship one God, one God alone, and all of us say absolutely true. We affirm that. Deuteronomy and other scriptures explicitly prohibit, prohibit it making any form, any image of God and bowing down to that form and worshiping it. And we also repudiate that completely. We do not make a statue. We do not make an image. We do not make a picture of God. We do not have an image of Jesus that we, and we bow down to that form no one has seen God at any time. We affirm that. And God did not become a man. So well, isn't that the incarnation? The incarnation is that the eternal God, while remaining eternal God in heaven and filling the universe and sitting on his throne, yet walked among us. His word became flesh. It's a great mystery. Someone was challenging me about this one time and, and trying to just get me to boil it down to a yes or no and two-word statement. And I said, you know, this may be a little too deep for you. 
We're talking about great, unfathomable spiritual mysteries. There was a woman I spoke with who had been with the Lubavitcher Hasidim for 14 years, or 17 years, I believe, from the ages of 14 to 31. And I was talking to her, to her via email back and forth, and she was confused. She had, she had believed in Jesus in a certain way, but didn't really know him, and now was questioning everything, and just was questioning so many issues about who God is, and, and couldn't put these things together, and so on. And then God began to deal with her very intensely in her own life. I remember saying to myself, well, I may not have an answer for all of her questions that's working right now. I have answers. Somehow they're not penetrating. It's not hitting home. But she can't get away from conviction. So I just began to pray God reveal her sin to her. As far as I knew, she was living a basic moral, godly life and happily married. But she's a human being. In the sight of a holy God, she's guilty. So I just began to pray God reveal her sin to her. And she had made it clear she wasn't going to dialogue with me, interact anymore. She'd reached out for help. A friend referred her to me. I began to interact with her. She made a plan. She wasn't going to interact anymore. And I was ready to write her back. And she said, look, when your books come in the mail, thanks for sending them, but, but I'm not going to receive them. I'm sending them back. I'm not listening to the debates. I need the tapes. Sorry. It's all going back to you. And I was, I was writing her a response and thinking, should I send this? Should I not send this? And it just disappeared. Didn't go in my inbox, didn't go in the trash, it disappeared. I thought, okay, hands off. I'm going to leave this to God. Even I catch on after a little while. So I, I just prayed, God, convict her, show her her sin. And uh, it's about 12 hours later, I get this email for her. She, she hadn't slept through the night. She was in absolute agony of heart. She had come under his deep conviction of sin of anybody I knew. Just God began to work on her. I mean, absolutely undone. She said her children are looking at her. Her whole face looks black just from crying and no sleep. And she can't believe how she's treated her husband through these years. All these things just rising to the surface. And I sent her a note. I said, now would probably be a good time to talk by phone. And she called and was just shaken up. She was an educated woman, I believe a math professor at a university. And, but just very much undone. And, so I just wanted to talk to her at more length and do you understand, went through the scriptures. I knew she was ready to pray, but I really wanted her to understand. And I said, you know, what do you want to do? I want to get right with God. I want to, okay. So I said, well, you pray and I'll agree with you. I said, I don't know what to say. I said, all right, I'm going to say these words. And if I say them, only if you agree with them, I want you to follow them with me and pray them to God. And I let her in a prayer of repentance and acknowledgement that Yeshua died for her sins and confessing him as Lord. And not only was she instantly delivered from, from guilt, it, it was such a wild transformation so instantly that you, you wonder, is this, is this actually happening or has someone set this up to just play games with us? Until I talked to her husband the next day. I knew it was real, but I, I wanted to be sure. But the thing that was wild is no sooner did she pray, she said, I get it, I get it. Just about the nature of God, she said, it's bigger than me, it's not mad, it's, it's sort of a light just, I get it, I see it. Just boom, the light went on. These are mysteries, but they are mysteries that are spoken of in the scriptures. And when we put them together rightly, we come to these biblical conclusions. So when, when God said in Deuteronomy 6, and when we're told by Moses to say these words, he speaks them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Echad. What does that mean? He is Echad. There are some rabbis who translated it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Understanding Echad to mean that one, that one alone. Even the New Jewish version translates it in that way based on those traditions. Gives this as a potential rendering. Echad, that one, that one alone. First Chronicles 29, 1 Chronicles 29.1. 1 Chronicles 29.1. Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, whom God has chosen, the one whom God has chosen is young and inexperienced. There Echad is used. That one, that one alone. 
And really, that was the great battle. When, when Moses is saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, he's not telling them, I want you to know the nature of our God. I want you to understand that he is one. Each God in itself was one. The, the greater revelation is there, he and he alone. He is our God, he alone. So it, it's very possible, even probable, that the the right interpretation of those words is not even emphasizing his oneness, but rather that he is God alone. But let's just accept the traditional understanding that akkad here means one, not alone, but one. Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, the Lord our God, Adonai Echad, the Lord is one. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. What does that actually tell us? In point of fact, the word echad does not tell us anything about the essential nature of God's unity. Sometimes it can refer to one, just one solitary, okay, in context, you know, one alone and not someone else. But many examples in Scripture, it's speaking of several things being one, just like the English word one, okay? We can talk about one month, one team, one group, one country, many parts. So, for example, Genesis 1, there's morning and evening. What? Yom Echad, day one. One day. Morning and evening make up one day. How about Genesis 2? That should come to mind pretty easily. All the references, again, laid out in the, in the study guide and in depth in volume two. Adam and Eve. Therefore man will leave his father and mother and will cleave to his wife and the two, the two will become echad, one. How about the building of the tabernacle? In Exodus, God says that the Many parts of the tabernacle will be put together so you will have one tabernacle, echad. One month. What's the point? The point is echad in and of itself does not define the nature of God's unity. It could refer to one solitary one or the two becoming one or five in one or ten in one or a hundred in one. Just like our English word one, in and of itself, it does not tell us anything about God's unity. What we learn from Scripture is that His unity is complex. That's the best way that I can describe it and be faithful to the Scriptures. God's unity is complex. He is one, but in a complex way. Sometimes we, we search for earthly analogies by which we can describe spiritual things. So they're all imperfect analogies. But some have used the illustration of the physical sun to try to convey a point. When we look at the sun, we actually don't see the sun. It's too bright. What we see are the rays coming out from the sun. And then what actually touches us here is a different form of those rays. The heat of the sun touches us here. Right now, America is in the midst of this heat wave. That's from the sun 93 million miles away. I'm not giving precise scientific technical explanations of this, but you understand that it's, we're being touched by the sun here. When you look at the sun, you're actually seeing the rays that project from it, but the actual essence of it itself you're not seeing. So some have used that to try to explain aspects of God's complex unity or triunity, that God in his essence remains unseen and unseeable by mortal eyes. What we do see is, is the shooting forth of his rays, the sun, who is the express image of God. And then what touches us it's the equivalent of the Holy Spirit working among us. And yet it's one sun. Yes, it is an imprecise analogy. But it's just, it's, it's a physical way of saying sometimes unity can be complex. We spoke about human nature being an example of that. 
Why do I say based on the scripture that God's unity is complex? Why do I say that the only scriptural conclusion that is fair is to say that his unity is complex? Several reasons. We have the same Bible telling us that he can't be seen that also tells us about times when he is seen. We have the question of him being infinite, untouchable, and yet reaching out and touching and communing with us. We have him being hidden, and yet we have him being revealed. We have him being distant, and we have him being near at the same time. We have him enthroned in heaven, and yet we have him among us. Now, I'm going to give scriptural examples in a moment, but when you look at these, you say, okay, it's, it's not that simple a question when we speak of his unity, and even in Jewish mysticism and in other forms of rabbinic thought, there are questions about these very issues. How does he commune with us or walk among us or reveal himself to us? So let's start in Genesis 18. This is one of these passages read and reread, reread and reread, and, and tried to just figure out other ways to read it that would violate my understanding of the text, and it's just comes back to the same thing. This is clearly what is written and spoken here. Genesis 18. Yahweh appeared to Abraham. Right? The Lord, remember, capital L and capital O-R-D, Yahweh. Yahweh appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Now, according to rabbinic tradition, Yahweh appeared to Abraham by sending three angels. Yahweh himself was not among them. Rather, three angels were among them, one of whom was Raphael, who was checking on Abraham, who had been circumcised in the previous chapter, and he was checking on his physical health. And visiting the sick is a meritorious thing to do, and these angels were doing this in an exemplary way. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Now, of course, you had some later Christians read this the moment they saw three men, they got excited, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but f forget that, okay. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance to, of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. This puts the lie to the idea that he had just been circumcised, because men just circumcised are not running to greet people. So this is some account that takes place later on. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord... Or, O Lord, with a capital L, do not pass your servant by. Now, here's the deal. When the Hebrew text refers to Yahweh, yud heh vav -Hey, there's no question about that. But here, in verse 3, v'yomar Adonai, the way it is pointed here, in uh, the way the vowels occur in the Masoretic Bible that I have here, it's Masoretic traditional text that I have here, the way the vowel occurs, it is referring to Yahweh. Adonai, with particular vowels, refers to Yahweh. Adoni or Adonai, written with other vowels, could refer to just one master or lord or several. Sirs, potentially. What's he saying here? The way the vowels are written in the traditional Hebrew text, he is addressing one of them as Lord with a capital L in the traditional Hebrew text. But let's just say question mark on that, okay? Maybe there's an issue with the vowels. Let's just say question mark. Even though that supports our view, we'll say question mark. He said, if I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed, and then go on your way now that you've come to your servant. Very well the answer, do as you say. So maybe he doesn't even know who they are. Yahweh appeared to him. Maybe it's just three angels, just like three regular men. He doesn't know who they are. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of fine flour, knead it, and bake some bread. 
Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set those before, set these before him. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then Yahweh said, oh, hang on, NIV gives a note. They're just explaining it. Then he said, so we don't know who he is. Question mark. Then he said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. It certainly sounds like something God would say. I'll surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out, my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then Yahweh said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So it was Yahweh that was speaking this previous verse. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Okay, now look, this is a conversation going on with people standing next to each other. You, you would have to be completely using the wildest imagination to say that Abraham is having a conversation and suddenly, the Lord says I'm going, it's this voice from heaven. And then Sarah starts laughing, <laughs> right? I mean, even though it was God's voice from heaven. Why did you laugh? I didn't laugh. I heard you laugh. You're, you're just reading a conversation here. I mean, unless one of the angels is representing Yahweh, but it says Yahweh said. Yahweh appeared to him. Yahweh said, Abraham's having a conversation with him. Now remember, there was a time in Genesis 3 where Yahweh walked with, with Adam and Eve in the garden. Now there's been separation because of sin, but he's revealing himself. Now look at this. It keeps going. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on the way. Then Yahweh said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he goes on. Verse 20, then Yahweh said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before Yahweh. One ancient Hebrew scribal tradition says Yahweh remained standing before Abraham. So, so hang on, let's get this picture. The men are going on their way. Yahweh's deliberating, should I tell him or not? I'm going to tell him. Right? The men turned and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before Yahweh. Then Abraham approached him and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And he begins to intercede. An extraordinary passage. Verse 26, Yahweh said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I'll spare the whole place for their sake. Even this, by the way, can play into that concept of the power of the righteous and so on. Verse 27, then Abraham spoke up again, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Now, every conversation back and forth. It goes back and forth and back and forth. Verse 32, he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord, when Yahweh had finished speaking with Abraham, he left. Okay? And Abraham returned home. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. I mean, this is really remarkable. Yahweh and two angels appear to Abraham. Yahweh has an extended conversation, first with Abraham and Sarah, back and forth, interaction. And then Abraham goes to see the men on their way. How many of them get to Sodom? Two. What happens to Yahweh? He stays and dialogues with Abraham. And then when he's done, he leaves and Abraham goes home. And the two angels, these two messengers of the Lord, get to Sodom. 
if you didn't know any better, if you didn't know that this was not supposed to happen and that it couldn't possibly happen because it's contrary to some tradition somewhere, it'd be a pretty straightforward text. All the players are pretty clear. They're all accounted for. So am I to understand that Abraham actually saw Yahweh? Am I to understand that the verses where God tells Moses, no one can see my face and live, John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time, 1 Timothy 6 that we quoted, that he dwells in unapproachable light whom no one can see. Am I to understand that, that Abraham actually saw Yahweh? Well, if I just read what the text says, I'd have to say yes, but if I believe the other text, I'd have to say there's a question. Could it be that Yahweh left his throne in heaven and came down and walked among us and ceased to be ruling and reigning from his throne in heaven and took a little time off to walk among us? You say, but you don't understand, God can fill the universe. God can manifest himself in different ways. God can walk among us on the earth and sit in throne in heaven at the same time. What do you know? I believe that too. So I, I just present this first as simple evidence. The first time I ever raised this in a debate with a rabbi many years ago, he said, I, Michael, I'm disappointed with your lack of knowledge of Jewish angelology. No, it's not a lack of knowledge of Jewish angelology. It's, a, it's an adherence to the biblical text. And again, it's, it's not a matter of can God speak through an angel. Of course he can. Can an angel say, this is what the Lord says? Sure, just like a prophet can. But when there's a conversation and it says the Lord said to Abraham, said to Sarah, said and back and forth, and then the Lord and Abraham are talking and the other two go over here, it's telling me something very plain. And this is also written before all the verses that say no one can see God. And so on. So you're going to read this and think, well, Yahweh actually appeared to him, talked to him, had a conversation, interacted, heard his prayer, heard his cry, left, and the angels went on their way. Could it be at this same time that he was sitting enthroned in heaven? Could it be at this same time that his presence was filling the universe? Just consider some of these statements about God's own nature. Take a look in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at what God says about himself. in his oracle against the false prophets. Verse 23, Jeremiah 23, 23. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Am I, am I just some local, low-level neighborhood deity? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth? In one real sense, God fills heaven and earth. Yet in another sense, he sits enthroned in heaven, dwelling in unapproachable light. Psalm 139 reiterates that on a personal level. Where, where can I go from your presence? And, and look at how vividly it's laid out. Verse 7, Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. God, your presence fills the universe. And yet at the same time, he sat enthroned in heaven. And wait, think of this. He said that he would dwell in the midst of his people through the tabernacle and, and, and through the temple. I'm simply saying that God's unity is, is different than human unity. God's oneness is far more expansive and wide and mystical than just saying one person, even though in ourselves in a certain way we're complex in our unity. God tells the children of Israel in Exodus 25, 8, the Suli Mikdash, have them make for me a sanctuary, a holy place, for Shachan Tocham, and I will dwell in their midst. I will dwell in their midst. I'll tabernacle among them. The Jewish concept of the Shekhinah, 
Some Christians call the Shekinah glory. His presence in our midst, God's presence on the earth, that comes from that same root, Shachan. Have them build me a holy place, Exodus 25, 8, and I will Shachan in their midst. That's a theme you have repeatedly. God will dwell in the midst of his people. He'll walk among them and live among them by his spirit, but that's still God. I mean, it's sitting enthroned in heaven, yet filling the universe, putting the spirit on the prophets, the one God. And even appearing to Abraham. Let's just say that we can make a very good case for the fairest, most honest reading of that text. Gave it to a hundred people that could read Hebrew and just said, read it and please explain what happened. Let's just say that they would come to the majority conclusion that Yahweh, in a physical way, because Abraham saw him with the other man, waited on him, and he ate, right? His feet were washed. If Yahweh could appear in a physical form and walk among us on the earth, whether it was for two minutes or ten minutes, or two hours or ten hours, certainly this picture here is a matter of hours and the food preparation, the cooking of the animal and everything involved, a matter of hours. If he could do that while remaining God in heaven, then a fundamental objection to the incarnation has just been overcome. A fundamental objection that, that God could not live among us in the person of his son. If he could live among us for hours, he could live among us for years. While still remaining the unseen, invisible, eternal God in heaven. Let's take a look at some of these verses. Let's go to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. Based on Hosea 12, we understand that Jacob was wrestling with an angel of the Lord. Hebrew word for angel, just like the Greek word, malach in Hebrew and angelos in, in Greek, is, is a messenger. It, it can sometimes refer to an earthly messenger or to an angelic, heavenly messenger. But we understand from Hosea 12, he was wrestling with an angel. According to the text here in chapter 32, a man wrestled with him. Genesis 32, 24, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Then the man said in verse 28, your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Verse 30, so Jacob called the place Peniel, face of God, saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. I wonder what he meant by that. Did he, did he actually think that the man with whom he was wrestling was, was God himself, that God left his throne above and, and came down, that the God who filled the universe, or the God who revealed himself in Genesis 28 had, had now actually become a man and wrestled with him? It's possible, but to me that's reading a bit much into it. Did he at the very least believe that in some way in wrestling with this man, this angelic messenger, this divine messenger, that he had actually had an encounter with God? Absolutely, because he said, my life was spared, even though I've seen God. At the very least, I've seen a divine being. I've, I've, I've seen a God-like one, but in the most simple reading of the text, I saw God face to face, and my life was spared. Somehow he recognized in this wrestling with a man that he had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. I saw God face to face. Now remember that. Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33. Moses, passionate for the Lord, meeting with him in the tent of meeting. He prays in verse 18 of Exodus 33. Moses said, now show me your glory. Yahweh said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name Yahweh in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. So my glory is going to pass by. You can see my 
my back or hinder parts. But you can't see my face because no one can see my face and live. Yet Jacob said he saw God face to face. So whatever Jacob saw was something that Moses couldn't see. Whatever Abraham saw was something different than what Moses couldn't see. Whatever John 1.18 says, no one's seen God, that, that must be the same thing that Moses is speaking of here. Yet Jacob saw something. But here we have a clear statement from God himself. You cannot see my face. No one may see me and live. So then you have to ask the question, when, when people saw God, who did they see? What did they see? When, when they had this divine encounter, what was it? With whom? If no one can actually see his face and live, then who did they see? Let's take a look at a fascinating text, Exodus 24. Now remember the emphasis put on Sinai, the revelation of God at Sinai. You didn't see any form at Sinai. And yet God actually revealed himself visibly at Sinai. Just going with what the text says. Exodus 24, verse 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadav and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up Oh, come on, how could this be written in the Torah? Not at Sinai when God doesn't want anyone to get any wrong ideas or impractical. Who put this in here? Some Christian later stuck this in here, trying to mess with this. No, it's just what reads in the Torah. Moses and Aaron, Nadav and Abihu, and the seven yellows of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. This is staggering. Under his feet, here's the description. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. They saw God and they lived. Why didn't he raise his hand? You would have expected he would have raised his hand because you can't see him. That doesn't say they saw his face. When, when, when you have the, the a vision of Ezekiel, the closer you get to the face of God, the more it's, and I saw what was like something that was like similar to something like this. It becomes more and more indescribable. Yet, they saw the God of Israel. It doesn't say they saw a vision of him. Because if it was just a vision, that wouldn't draw attention to the fact that he didn't strike them. And it wouldn't make a big deal of the fact that they saw him and they ate and they drank. It wasn't just a mental image or a hallucination. They actually saw him. Yet, Scripture tells us that he is unseeable. Scripture tells us no one's ever seen him. John tells us no one's seen him. Paul tells us he dwells in unapproachable light. No one can see him. He himself, a few chapters later, says to Moses, no one can see my face and live. The only conclusion we can draw is there is an aspect of God in his very essence and being that is invisible, that cannot be seen, that cannot be touched. That mortal eyes cannot look upon and survive. And yet in another way, he reveals himself so that he can be seen, so that he can be known, so that he can be experienced. The whole message of the incarnation, the whole message of the Word becoming flesh, the whole message of the Son coming to dwell in our midst is to reveal the unseeable, hidden, invisible God, yet the Son himself is God. Just like they saw God, but nobody can see God. Isaiah 6, Isaiah chapter 6, well-known passage. Interestingly, it doesn't say I had a vision. I had a dream. In the year that King Uzziah, King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Ha'adon, Yahweh. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his throne filled the temple. When I first read that years ago, I just made an assumption, and then for years I just assumed that the assumption was right, I never questioned it, that Isaiah saw into the heavenly temple and, and saw God sitting in his heavenly throne in the heavenly temple. It could be true, but it just says that, that the train of his throne filled the temple. A very likely possibility is that Isaiah went into the temple in Jerusalem as he had many times before, and this time, oh my God. God is here. 
on a much lesser level. It's, it's like if you've ever been in one of those services where the presence of God comes in in an overwhelming way, one of those take off your shoes for the place is whole, get on your face. Presence of God is here, one of these overwhelming times. Been in meetings like that over the years, and someone will just say, God's here. I said, well, wait, he's always here. Don't you know where two or three gather together? I mean, he's always, the presence of the Lord is, no, 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 you understand, God's here. This is different. Isaiah goes into the temple, and uh, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. Remember those words, high and exalted? We told you that in Isaiah, those are always speaking about the Lord. Ram and Nisah is high and exalted, and yet in Isaiah 52, 13, they're applied to the servant of the Lord, who's high and exalted. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were all crying to another, calling to one another, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Holy, holy, holy. Yahweh of Tzvaot. The whole earth is full of his glory, or filling the whole earth with his glory. It's an extraordinary vision. And then, what does he say? Verse 5. Woe to me. Oi, Lee. I cry. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Woe is me. I'm going to die because I've seen the Lord, His holiness, His presence, His power. Who did Isaiah see? No one can see God. Who did the elders of Israel see? No one can see God. Who did Jacob see? No one could see God. Who did Abraham see? No one can see God. Yet they all saw him. God is complex in his unity. The one God whom we worship, the only God whom we worship, is complex in his unity. We do not worship an earthly form or bow down to the form of a man we recognize from the witness of the Hebrew Scriptures and the full revelation in the New Covenant writings that God can make Himself known among us, that God Himself can pitch His tent among us, that God in His complex unity can remain God enthroned in heaven, eternal and invisible, that His presence can fill the universe, and that His localized presence can come right into our midst, clothed with flesh and blood. That is the God that we worship. There is nothing idolatrous, blasphemous, polytheistic about that concept. When we rightly understand Yeshua's deity, it is a teaching firmly grounded within the Hebrew Scriptures themselves. Let's just pray. Father, we love you and honor you. I think of the words of the psalmist, Gal enayva bita niflaot mitoratech. And cover my eyes that I may behold wonders from your Torah. Indeed, we will behold wonders. Open our eyes, our hearts, our minds to your holy truth that you may be glorified in our midst. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen.